you. Good afternoon, everyone uh, in the room and also listening to us abroad. Uh, I have the pleasure today to talk about duck fire. Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a mover because I'm Italian. That's why you'll see me with a clicker and I'll, I'll be back away from the, uh, the uh, podium just a little bit. But today I want to take the opportunity, especially with Drew starting and welcome Drew. We're very excited to have you, uh, is to give an opportunity to make sure we're all on the same page with duck fire and how we operate within the town. Um, I'm gonna go through how duck fire started, how we're integrated, and um, these are my objectives today. I wanna make sure everyone understands the history of duck fire. We have new volunteers uh, sitting in the, in the audience here today that might not even know our full history as they're actually relatively new within the last year or two. I wanna show the progression of how duck fire and the town are integrated, what things are together, what things are actually separate. Um, I wanna review 2020, just our stats. You hear them every month, but just review them and you know how much I love my graphs. So yes, you'll see some of those. Uh, and then talk about looking forward, uh, the kind of the theme of today. It's really funny, none of us saw each other's presentations going into today, but I think you'll see a similar theme with all of them. And then obviously I'll take any questions at the end. Um, the radio question, I'll start there. Uh, Trey has hmm, four or five slides maybe. To explain that, I'd like to get through my presentation and then we can bring them up to answer any questions. So the first thing I wanna talk about, and I've actually written an article for a publication and I also did a presentation for another group of people on perspective and expectation. So there you see a glass of water. Some people's perspectives, it's half full. Some people's perspectives, it's half empty. Another way to look at it with mental health is, is it good to have your cup running over or is it bad to have your cup running over? So I talk a lot about perspective and expectation within the firehouse because we can say right now, we all have an expectation if the house is burning, we're gonna put water on it. But how we all look at that is very differently. We're all gonna agree, we're gonna put water on it, we're gonna put the fire out. But I can tell you how I'm looking at that fire, how Cameron's looking at that fire, how our new volunteers are looking at that fire, how our captains are looking at that fire, how Drew's looking at that fire, in hell, even our PIOs looking at that fire can be very different because we all play a different role trying to get to that same expectation. So I bring that up today because I think it's important not just for fire, I think for police, I think for the town, is when we're looking at doing things and how we do them, we all come at it from a different perspective and hopefully we have common expectations and common purpose going forward. So to start, I think we need to make sure we all have an understanding and expectation of what Duck Fire is. Duck Fire is a combination department. In 1982, it was a volunteer department. We'll get to that. But we're a combination department now. We have fully career, full-time employees. Some are here today that are on duty. And we also have volunteers that get nothing. They get an, a, a recognition dinner at the end of the year. They get gear. They get nothing, they don't get a paycheck, nothing like that. So we are a combination department and our, combina our combination department sets out for the same exact mission. We want a protected community and we're all hazards response. So whether Mrs. Jones calls because she's having a heart attack, whether Mrs. Jones calls because her smoke detector's broken, whether Mrs. Jones calls because her house is flooding, we are trying to provide that service and that we don't do alone. So here's my mutual aid slide at the same time. We have 15 fire departments in Dare County and none of us do it alone. So a single engine response might be a hazardous condition, the smell of smoke before the fire. But if anything major is going on that's a public safety threat, we are, our mutual aid partners are very important. We work a lot with them, I have a slide later as well, but no one does it alone, but we have a responsibility to our communities and then we can get help when we need it. So I'd like to take a minute and talk about the evolution of duck fire, how it started, how we were funded. I'm gonna go through that just quickly, but enough so that everyone understands exactly where we were and how we got to where we are today. Uh, the first slide today, just a, I, I threw a few volunteers in here and some, some of you know them all, uh, not probably the whole room would know Glenn Miller. He was a founding member of the fire department, uh, lived on I think Dune, family still has a house here, Dooner Cook. Um, he was there in my time when I joined as a volunteer, very important member in starting the fire department. Another picture I really should have in here is Aubrey Kitchen, lives on Seahawk. He was a founding member as well, 20 plus volunteer with us. These are the folks that started Duck Fire, that started not only the tradition, but the financial prowess, the 
balancing of budgets and the looking forward to make sure duck fire was sustainable even in 1982. I don't know anyone that doesn't know Rick. <laughs> Rick is a longtime member, 20 plus member with the fire department, has been our treasurer for years, is not our treasurer right now. I'll get to that. And then many of you know John Britt. He sat on this council with us here today. He's the guy that tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, we need volunteers, do you wanna be one? Um, he's since retired with us this past year, uh, very concentrated on his family, his son, and gave 27 years to the fire department and we appreciate him. So that's the evolution of fire from a Glenn Miller up to a John Britt, and now to what is a combination department. We'll be 40 years next year, Duck Fire will, as the town will be 20. And what a difference 40 years makes. We had promotions at the beginning of the year. We have new volunteers, a couple sitting in the audience, uh, and we have a career staff now. So let's go through that. Where did we start and how did we get here? Duck Fire Incorporated in 1982. I'm not gonna read everything. You'll see a theme with a few of these slides. Uh, we were funded by a fire tax and donations from our pig picking. If you haven't seen an old picture of a 1980s and 90s pig picking or did not attend one up till about 2003, for I think we had them going when I was first hired. Um, that was a major fundraiser and brought in a lot of people to eat uh, pork from the back of the fire department for years. The property at the time, and I did put this in here purposely, if you read it, I couldn't find the first one, but I found the second one. The property, there's a document, it was called the Modification of Out Grant. And it basically said this instru instrument extends subject lease for a five-year period for the County of Dare, North Carolina, to operate and maintain a fire department and branch office of the County's Sheriff Department. So that was the first lease paper I could find. There was obviously one more before that. So within that fire department, it was built and maintained by the volunteer firefighters. Through the county, it was leased for the sheriff's department in a section of the building, which is now the police department. So it's the same space. Matter of fact, I think we gave you a little more at one point. So that was in 1982. In our articles of incorporation, we had the purpose, and I was going to read it to you, but I'm not because I'm, I'm going to be shorter than Joe. Um, I decided to not read the charter, but it's all the same things you would want now. Fire protection, being able to acquire equipment and land for a firehouse, fire prevention, education, inspection, all those things were in that 1982 charter, and the things we're still doing today. The membership, uh, the Articles of Incorporation said the membership shall have members as defined by the bylaws. We still do that today. And in those original Articles of Incorporation, there were three elected officials within the fire department. So the chair, vice chair, and what was the secretary treasurer. The chief was an ex officio member. That's really important to remember when we fast forward to 2020. So that was 1982, we started, we broke off, Kitty Hawk was the fire district, I believe ourselves, Southern Shores and Collington, all in the same time frame, broke off to do their own 501C and incorporated fire departments. Statistics at the time, 1982, 30 annual calls, 19 members, ironically, right now we have 19 members, uh, and 400 residential homes. In 95, there was an amendment to the Articles of Incorporation to have five board members. And it's really interesting because one of the positions in 1995 they added was purchasing agent. Probably important, 13 years into incorporation, getting more equipment, getting more purchases, it's all volunteers, need a little more help on the board. Bam, we went to five. And then what happened? So from 1982, leading up to the incorporation of 2002, Duck Fire had it going on, right? It was the building for everything. It was where the volunteers were. It was where probably the first meetings of incorporation started until they went to uh, Paul Keller's kitchen table, uh, I believe. But a couple of our firefighters were even on that committee that looked at incorporating. But prior to incorporation, everything happened at the Duck Fire house. The DCA met there, pig picking was there, community meetings were there on homeowner weekends. All of that was happening out of that building. And then November 6, 2001, the community decided and voted for incorporation. Part of incorporation in House Bill 882 was Article 9, Section 9.2. And in that section, I won't read the whole thing, but it basically says the fire protection of town of Duck shall contract with Duck Volunteer Fire Department Incorporated. 
So from 1982 to 2002, it was just Duck Fire. We were a fire district um, answering basically to the county upon incorporation in 2002. We then basically were answering to the town, but we were still a contracted service, if you will. So in 2002, go back to that same slide, where'd we get our funding? At the beginning of 2002, we got our funding through a fire tax. Thank you, Monica, because I think she remembered it was seven cents. Um, then in the second half of the year, it was actually direct revenues from the town of Duck. Again, donations, we were holding on to the pig picking and t-shirt sales. As you know, you put duck on something, they come and they buy. So that's really when we started uh, really noticing t-shirt sales was about that point. The property at the time, and I don't know when it switched, I didn't go to back to every lease, but in 2002, the lease was then with the Secretary of the Army directly with Duck Volunteer Fire Department Incorporated for the operation of the fire department. It's five-year leases. That one at 2002 was July 15th, 2002 to July 14th, 2007. Our current lease, and I think I have a slide in here, goes to 2023. At the time, the fire department repaired and maintained and had oversight of what we now call the public safety building. So that was 2002. So you take that time frame from 1982 to 2002, and this is the change in call volume. So in 1982, we had 30 calls. In 2002, when incorporation came, it's 364 calls. A couple key things to note with that, that pretty big increase. One is 1994. 1994 is the year Tom Galloway and other members of the Duck Fire Department recognized, recognized we need to do more for the community and start first responding to medical calls. That was the beginning of Rescue 11. So that's when they decided we're not just gonna answer fire calls, we wanna go and help the community assist EMS and that's when Rescue 11 and first responding first started. You can absolutely see that from 1992 to 1997, the jump in call volume. The second dot to notice, the two stars, is in 2001, the board of directors, we, in the late 90s, we always had a position where the fire chief, the volunteer fire chief, was also the full-time paid maintenance guy. So they were there all day, they did maintenance on the trucks, they took care of the paperwork, they were the volunteer chief, but they were paid to, to do the maintenance stuff. By 2001, late 90s, early 2000s, the board of directors realized we needed to, one, be equitable to our chief at the time and also try to catch up with the rest of the area. And the board of directors designated the chief as the chief and adjusted salaries and things like that so that that position was recognized. So we've had a paid chief position in place prior to incorporation. The other key between 1997 and 2002, which also stemmed from incorporation, what was happening? The big building boom. When I moved here, Four Seasons wasn't even here. Four Seasons was just dunes. So there was the big boom. Um, we knew things were getting busier. We wanted a chief in place. Um, and we also knew with incorporation that we'd probably have more service demands, which you'll see in a minute. So look, let's look at the trends in volunteers. 1982, 19, and, you, and again, I just took the same years just to give you a rough and dirty idea. But in 2002, we had 36 volunteers. And you know where those 36 volunteers lived? In Duck. So we had 36 firefighters living in Duck in 2002. And most of them were suppression firefighters. So that's a big difference in 2002 to have 36 people not just living in town, but be able to do some of the work that we now have others to do. So what happened? In 2003 was the migration, the great duck migration, when we started to look at do we need help, not just from volunteers. So we started to look at this ability to migrate and basically to transition to get some career firefighters. So how did we go about doing that? It was membership driven. It was a recognition by the members of the fire department and the board of directors that, hey, we're getting busy, we're all volunteers, there's a change in service demands, the budget process is different because now it's not just giving it to the county, you know, we're working with the town, there's increased building, there's increased tourism, and what was it? The board of directors was in charge of the chief. Well, the chief operationally was in charge of the board of directors. So you had this circle, there wasn't really a balance in, in um, oversight, if you will, in management. And we realized, you know what, with all this going on, 
maybe we better look at a different model. So it was member initiated, it was firefighter that initiated it, was kind of assigned to investigate it, talk to the town manager at the time, present it to the firefighters, and through a bylaw change, we approved that any paid fire personnel for the Duck Fire Department would go under the management of the town. We would give the town the higher fire privilege to oversee those personnel and take some pressure off us, let us do what we need to do, and not be responsible for that, um, that management piece. So in July 2004 was the first chief under the town of Duck and a member of Duck Fire. So all the firefighters, whether they're paid volunteer or part-time, they're members of Duck Fire Department Incorporated, it's just whether they're employees of the town or just volunteers with the incorporation. So when you fast forward to 2002, let's add some incidents on, which is, this is actually pretty interesting because I am that little data dork. From 1982 to about incorporation, you see the biggest increase in calls. From 2002 to now, we don't see that, you know, statistically, it's not that much in 18 years. Um, and we're not at, you know, they always say 750 is the magic number when you gotta start looking at things, but we don't have the call volume that actually I would have predicted in probably 2012. It's, it's more of a, a steady increase. Um, types of calls have changed, intensity of calls may have changed, but the volume has still kind of stayed steady. So when you look at grants and things like that, again, we fall into that. We don't have a huge call volume here, right? But we do have a, you know, a pretty steady call volume. But the biggest change happened around incorporation, which makes sense. So how did all the career firefighters come about? So 2004, we knew the, the chief position was there. Um, there was two chiefs prior to me. I was hired in 2006. Uh, I was the volunteer deputy chief at the time. I was actually working in Nags Head. I also served on the board of directors. I had a fair amount of background. Um, when they did the search that finally got me my position, um, I encouraged that search. I had served as interim twice. Um, after both other chiefs left, they kept putting me there, and then I finally put in, I was hired in 2006. The first thing I said to the town manager on my first day is I will keep it volunteer as long as I can, but we have to watch what's happening. Because we already knew in 2006 when I was there that we were starting to see changes. So we've gradually put, phased in the career staff over time. I'll get to that in a minute. But you can see the years in which we added folks and we requested as needed. It's not like I came in saying, okay, give me 12. Um, we did this very methodically. The first thing I knew is I needed help uh, with my stuff and we rec recreated a deputy chief position in 2007. And Captain Smith, who's still with us, was our first uh, shift employee as a captain in 2008. You wanna talk about a change for an individual in 12 years, sit down with Captain Smith. I think he's still adjusting to where we are when we hired him to where we are now. Does this model work? Yes. Um, and I think that's been part of the challenge over the last couple of years is everyone forgets that technically we're our own business over here because we look like part of the town. And that's the goal. It doesn't matter what it looks like on paper. What it matters is how we operate and how we're functioning. So why is it a successful hybrid model, a little different than other areas? Duck Fire's been able to maintain its brand. No one can take away the Duck Fire t-shirt. No one can take away the stories of the pig pickings. And if you'd ever been to one, you'd understand that. Um, we've been able to maintain the identity of Duck Fire. It promotes volunteering, which is great for this community. And it's what this community was built on. Great communication. If there's a focus on level of service, it doesn't matter. There's no, it's not about control. It's about making sure we provide a high level of service. The management, there's a balance to that. There's a balance in the personnel over, oversight and basically we're a division of the town. You, you wouldn't know any different unless you read the paperwork or actually listened to this presentation. From a budgeting standpoint, it's cooperative. We do the same thing that Chief Ackerman does, that Christian has to do, that Joe has to do. We're part of the budget process. It's no different. Uh, capital improvements plan, we've talked about that. I'll talk about it later. It's cooperative budgeting. Again, there's no hidden, I'm not coming to you as the chief of this incorporation going, ah, we need $500,000 this year because we want to change all this stuff. You know up front exactly what we need like everyone else. Um, it's allowed us to phase critical fire equipment, which I think I told you all in year one was my concern. And what I had the deputy chief do is we're gonna lay this out over time so we're not coming to the town asking for hundreds of thousands of dollars every year, except maybe the radios right now. Um, 
to make sure that we could do that over time. So it's been a successful model that really seems seamless unless you get down into the nitty gritty. So any questions on where we came from and how we are here before I switch to 2020? Make sense? Okay. Monica or Nancy? Because I can't see them. Okay. So let's switch now. We've gone from 1982 through incorporation and we're at 2020. So let's review 2020 quickly um, with where we have gone, what we've been doing, what we didn't accomplish, and uh, we'll start. So I'll go back to the slide you've seen already. Funding. We are part of the town of duck budget process. Donations and fundraising are ways we uh, supplement our funding through the incorporation. Donations are soft money and so are t-shirt sales. This was the year of COVID. No one was here for two months. We absolutely did okay and people were buying t-shirts online, but that was actually a funding source we lost for a couple months and I haven't run the total numbers for the treasurer yet. Um, but we were definitely down. So we had to, the shop was closed, so we modified uh, how we even sold t-shirts for a little while and how we changed our hours and everything around COVID. The property, we're under the five-year lease. So remember, Duck Volunteer Fire Department Incorporated right now holds the lease of the current public safety building, not the town of Duck. That will obviously change with negotiations as we go in uh, to the new property. The fire department is 38 and technically a half year old um, right now, we're halfway through this year. Repairs and maintenance are still the oversight of Duck Fire. So within our direct allocation, which I'll get to in a few minutes, we oversee repairs and maintenance. A capital project that came directly out of the budget of town would have been when we put the generator in years ago. But if the roof is bad, that's under our budget. If a HVAC unit goes, it's under our budget um, through our direct allocation. If it was really out of whack, uh, like a roof, then I would come back to the town manager and say, hey, this is a public safety building thing. Duck Fire can't cover it under an existing budget. Um, but we handle everything from the lights, electrical, plumbing, whatever it may be. It all comes through what we get as a direct allocation. This is our model at the end of 2020. Remember, our newest position didn't start till January. So you have a fire chief, a deputy chief, three shifts that work 24 hours. There's three captains, three master firefighters, three firefighter EMTs. We've supplemented with some part-time firefighters. I'll get to a minute. And then we have our volunteer firefighters. And again, we had that presentation in October and November, so I'm not gonna dwell a ton on, on this piece because you've all heard it for, before and relatively recently. We have two types of firefighters, suppression firefighters. I use this every year because it's really important to understand from a perspective and expectation standpoint. Our suppression firefighters are what we call our combat firefighters. They're full on SCBA wearing, running in the burning building, carrying the heavy equipment, physically able. It encompasses all our career staff. And you know what? We do have an expectation. We have an expectation that they fulfill the duties of a firefighter that can do all those things. There is an expectation there. Some of our volunteers can meet that expectation, but not all. So we've created a second membership, same thing, firefighters, they wear the same gear, they look the same, uh, support firefighters. They can do exterior firefighting, uh, they can drive, they can help with rehab, they can do command aid, they can do duties that support the operations on any emergency scene. An example is hooking the hydrant for the fire, is a support act activity. You know what happens if Ralph, who's sitting in the room here, if Ralph, our volunteer, can hook up the hydrant, what does it do to the other three on the engine? They can go start doing something towards the fire. Uh, this model's worked. It's been very successful. You don't know who's who on a scene other than if you really knew what you were looking for from a task. Uh, in 2020, we, we've talked a lot about COVID. I think the big takeaways for this is we modified our operations, our trainings, our standbys, how we monitored each other, and we were able to keep um, one of the incidents of COVID down within the public safety building, and we still responded. Not every fire department in Dare County chose to keep responding to medical calls and other calls for service during COVID. We thought it was important to still be there for the community. We modified with Dare County EMS if we had to, but if the pager went off, we went. We may have modified what we did on the call, how we were protected, um, but we still continued to respond. We had 5,315 training hours during this year, which I'm really happy about when you consider we had to modify for two months. 
We did go into um, some online training for everyone. We did get our Buxton Live burn in, which gives us a ton of hours towards training and preparing for it. Uh, but we were still able to keep our training hours up. And this is both uh, career and volunteers. We did 126 fire inspections. You all are very aware, if you pay attention to the monthly meetings of our my pie chart for calls, I usually do that with numbers. So in this one, I put the largest blocks of numbers and percentages to have a better idea of the type of calls instead of just a flat number. 44% of our calls are medical, Rescue 11. I was talking with Drew the other day. Statistically, that is really low. Uh, national average is probably 70 to 80% of fire departments respond to EMS related calls. We're at 44%. Now, you'll see another slide where it's a little higher because I threw surf rescue in there. I threw our med flight landings in there as medical because they're still considered a medical type call. But true rescue 11 and a station four response from EMS is 44% of our call volume. The next highest an alarm activation. I've said this for years, an alarm activation is alarm activation after we get there and know it's an alarm activation. Until then, if it goes off, we assume it's a fire, we're gonna respond the same way, we're gonna come off the engines the same way, wearing SCV tools, ticks, radios, until we determine otherwise. That's a chunk of what we do. Not all of them are alarm activations, sometimes they do turn into something else. Um, fire, 7.2%, hazardous conditions are anything from nails in the roadway to carbon monoxide detector. So that kind of covers everything. If I gave you every, uh, I was telling Drew the other day, if I broke it down with every code they have in NIFRS, you'd kill me. You'd have a spreadsheet about this big. So I tried to lump them into what makes the most sense. 6.2% is public service. That could be opening a locked door. Um, it could be helping with a smoke detector or any time the community may need us. And then motor vehicle accidents are a small portion um, a lot of times we're not even called to those if they're fender benders, law enforcement actually handles them. Two significant events last year, um, obviously they get the most attention, one because they're, they're pretty impressive looking, um, is the fully involved structure fires. We had two of them, one on 106 Bayberry Drive on July 11th at 5 p.m. basically, and then December 20th at 112 East Seahawk. The irony of this, it means nothing. Aubrey, if you're listening, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> same builder, same model house, actually. Um, we got to the second one. I think DC and I were like, do you notice something? <laughs> uh, just happened to be the same, same house, totally different reasons that they had fires, uh, just kind of a strange situation there. Um, I will come, come back to fires in a minute. The other piece, this is just, I'm not gonna read them, a couple of citizen appreciation quotes. And here's the thing, we can teach anyone, I can teach anyone in this room to put on gear, grab a hose line and put water on a fire. But we can't, what you can't teach and what I think you really um, benefit with the staff you have in Duck is you can't teach the other stuff. The moments when it's not a technical skill, when someone's sick and whether we saved them or didn't save them is the second one we'll, we'll show you, they, they passed. Um, what we did. So when we hired in 2018, I, I looked at my captains, I'm like, I know you're gonna make them great firefighters, but I need you to make them good humans because that's the part that lingers and that's the part um, that matters in the end. We don't run many of those big calls where we're using all our skills, but we are in contact with the, with the public every day and you can't teach that. And that's why I'm really proud of, of the entire Duck Fire Department when we get things like this. So thank you to all of you. When you look at incidents, um, incidents all, all over, but 60% of our calls happen between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. So if you had a department with a lot of volunteers that worked all the time, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. is a problem. Strangely for us, we're lucky we have a lot of retired folks, so they tend to be available during the day, but what happens at night? Click, pager goes off. They're going to the club for a cocktail. So um, we're, we're an interesting mix because those that are suppression firefighters that don't live in town are working. Um, our volunteers that are retired and are doing standby, Ralph's one, he's with us during the day. Uh, you're an anomaly because he'll come out at night anyway. But we have others that are starting to click off and, and trying to sleep through the night a little bit. But most of our calls happen during the day, the least between midnight and 8 a.m. And then we still are pretty busy between dinner and, and uh, in midnight. Days of the week, 
it doesn't matter. We're pretty much evenly spread out percentage-wise. Tuesdays is still consistent. Every year, Tuesdays is just a little bit more. Um, I'm not guessing what that is, other than people are more comfortable by Tuesday from their start to their vacation. And I think that's when they tend to get more comfortable, maybe a little less uh, um, mindful of their actions. The other thing I like to look at is in the next two slides is just breaking down total calls, 484. In Drew's world, they probably do that in a month <laughs> from where he came from. But we have 484 calls and only about 50% are medical. That means the other 50% are some type of station response, which means it's not, okay, an EMT getting in a pickup truck and going, we're actually needing an engine response. Um, it could be for, you know, we lump everything in there, but that is different from the national average in that we, we're having station calls that are almost equal to our medical calls. The other piece is also looking at, I'd, I'd like to break it down by shoulder seasons. All my data starts in 2007 because that's the first year I was here for a full year and I could really um, be responsible for the data that we were collecting. So I look at off season as the blue line and I consider off season for all my graphs and I can do this any way you all ever wanted me to do. Um, but I take December, January and February is what I consider the true off season. And you can look over over the time I've been collecting data from 2007 to 2020, not a lot of change, right? It goes up and down, but it stays relatively flat. The orange line is what I call the shoulder season. So that would be March, April, and October and November. So call that the shoulder season. And you can see over time, definitely has increased in calls. So you would expect that we're starting to see our shoulder season um, spread out a little, but not totally significant. And then you can see what I consider peak season, or at least how I define it, as May through September. And again, um, strange year 2017 to 2018, but we're going to have more calls in that time frame. But really the graph is insignificant, right? Off season, it's pretty predictable. We'll probably have a call every other day, every third day on average. Uh, middle of the season, the shoulder seasons, it'll be a little more um, regular. And then by in season, three plus calls a day on average. Uh, again, just food for thought, but you don't see any real peaks and valleys. It's, it's, it's kind of consistent over time. And that's important when you start looking at service levels and people. This graph I added, this next graph, and I'm gonna set it up before I show it because It'll be confusing, but I'm a nerd and wanted to look at it. And it would be really interesting to take this data and put it with Joe's data or Monica's data on tourism. So I was curious because I report out every month um, how many calls we have per month. So what happened in 2020? We shut down for a couple months. So I decided, and, and DC was great, we ran like 12 or 15 years, and that was crazy. So I just chose four years, and we'll start with the red line, which is 2020. If you look at January to April, our average call volume went down, okay? So in Jan we had more calls in January than we did in April, okay? Then April hits, our call volume went up, and then look at that red line. It didn't spike way down. Our calls actually fell off more gradual. So what happened? We all know, we, can, we heard it from Joe's data yesterday, no one was here, people came, and they really didn't leave. And so that was reflected in our call volume. Look at the blue line, 2013, just for comparison, but that was several years ago, and that was the pattern, right? Eh, not that many people here, April hits, ooh, they come, everyone is here in July, and then they go away. So I just pulled this graph more because I thought it would be cool to look at, but I think what you can see, even with 2019, in 2020, there's a more gradual decrease in calls over the fall, which means more people are here. We're having more calls. We're not seeing that drop off. Um, again, it's not statistical. It's just kind of interesting. I really wanted to look at it against 2020. It would be interesting to put it against um, actual data of, of uh, tourism. So 2020 accomplishments, we'll start with staffing. This is a big year for Duck Fire because we're a young department. I'm, I'm the old lady and then I have the fire department and we have some volunteers that might have a few years on me. But from a career staffing piece, 
we're a very young department. We promoted the deputy chief this year, which created a captain's position. We promoted a captain, which created a firefighter position. We brought on a part-time to take that firefighter position. We created a, a permanent part-time position to try to help with staffing. Then we had someone leave to take another job in NOAA. We hired that guy. And thank you because of the, the work we did in the fall, we were able to take on one that started in January on January 4th. But we've had a lot of staffing changes. And for me, you'll see it in a future slide. Uh, one of my main responsibilities now is succession planning, is getting them, I want all of them to be able to stand here in their time. And um, that's some of my personal work that I will be working with, especially uh, the command staff on as well. We also had three new babies, which is a staffing issue. And we'll get to that. <laughs> um, COVID-19, we've talked about it. We did the things we needed to do to be able to continue to respond and to maintain staffing. Uh, we were very lucky for duck police and fire that we did not uh, lose gaps of time because of uh, uh, having to quarantine and those that may have been sick. EMS deployment strategy, we were able to put in place a, a process in which we can, uh, we implemented to get the EMS units up during our high volume days, whether they're weekends or midweek. And also we jointly did a resolution with Duck Volunteer Fire Department Incorporated and the town to encourage Dare County to continue to look at putting a unit in Duck. The fire ordinance approval was huge. That was over a year long process with other staff, with other departments. Sandy was very helpful, um, but a lot of people put a lot of work in that so that we could put everything we needed that had to do with fire or questions you might have about life safety in one location. Our volunteer training and response this year uh, with deputy chief in place, we have focused our Tuesday night trainings and our Saturday trainings on the volunteers. We have clear expectations of what we expect now. We're getting out first with our, our career staffing or standby, which is a good example today who's here. And that second piece, the rule is go. And we've got them designed now. They're not waiting, they're not waiting for anything, that all of our attention and training is on that volunteer response because it's delayed, their pager's going off and they're responding to the station to go with that second out apparatus. And there's a real change this year in what we're seeing and that be going out even for alarm activations that sound like nothing, they're responding, that's huge. And then annually, we did get our live burn training in. We have it scheduled for March this year. Um, if that's a go with COVID, we're working through some lo logistic changes. I'll invite Drew, council's always invited if they wanna come see that down in Buxton. We tested 12,960 feet of hose. We don't do that. We have a third party that certifies that. We did our ladder testing, pump testing, and also SCBA testing. The other change in 2020, um, which I reported out, but I'll explain why, is June 2nd at our annual meeting. We are required by bylaws to have an annual meeting of the Duck Volunteer Fire Department Incorporated. And at that meeting, we looked at the considerations to change our articles of incorporation back to the original. And the original was what? Three board members and the fire chief as an ex officio member of the board. How did we get there? Well, first of all, we have a change in membership type from volunteer to combination. While it's not in the bylaws that a career personnel staff can't serve on the board, we like that separation, okay? We think it's better for the organization. It's not that you can't, but we have uh, collectively said, let's try to avoid that and involve more of our volunteer members on that side of the house. Um, the authority of the town relating to career personnel, how we budget, uh, the cooperation budgeting, it's changed the role of the board of directors of the incorporation. Um, the changes in my administrative duties, I mean, I basically do all the work of as being police or fire chief, sorry, don't want to do that, uh, fire chief for the town, but also I am the support to the board. I am doing the administrative support uh, with the help of, of Nicole for the board of directors. Um, decrease in volunteer members and eligibility to serve. You can't join tomorrow and be on the board. You have to be there at least a year. And the last amendment change was in 2002. And it was 18 years ago, we decided to look at what's the best model for Duck Now, how we operate, and that's why we decided to go back to members of three. We're doing things exactly the same way. Do we need a purchasing agent? Yeah, we've already vetted that through CIP and annual budget and our process to accept. So um, it was agreed upon, it was unanimous by the membership, and that's why we went back to the original articles of incorporation. So your board of directors right now is Pat Scarlett. She's 23 plus years as our chair, not as our chair, but as a member. Um, 
ex-FDNY. Um, oh, sorry, I made her a firefighter, but she was a cop first. She was a police officer in New York City. Bob Mack, 17 years with us. He's a driver operator now, was a suppression firefighter. He's deserved the right not to wear an air pack anymore. If we had to put him one in one exteriorly, he would, but um, he's earned the right to go to driver operator and support us in that role and also as board of director. He's ex a uh, really cool government job. And then Kent Zimmerman is our treasurer now. He's been with us 11 years, a driver operator and um, was a professor. So that's our current board of directors. Couple things ongoing from 2020 to 2021. Town of Duck policies, obviously we're doing that policy review. Um, so I'm gonna to jump to the second column. With that, we're doing a risk assessment process with the league as well. It is not as defined as what law enforcement has, um, but we're working with TJ DeLuca and actually Chief and I have talked, I'm probably gonna take some of law enforcement stuff to augment what we're getting with um, TJ to make it a little more uh, standardized from them. We're not that far with the league. The fire doesn't, fire doesn't have the same assessment process that they do for law. Um, and with that comes our SOG review, because remember our SOGs within the fire department, not just cover, um, op, you know, management of personnel, but also of the whole operation, which includes volunteers and, uh, and career staff. That's ongoing. We're constantly looking at that. So that's all still ongoing for us. The emergency ops plan, uh, department heads sat down shortly after Joe was interim and we all put our input into updating the emergency ops plan with Drew here. We knew that you were coming. We've put that on hold and really wanna sit with you and see what you wanna add. I know there's things I've, I've been wanting to add. So um, we just put that over here until we got you comfortable. Utility 11 outfit, uh, I've talked about before. We haven't done an outfit yet. We've modified that outfit because we just don't have the money. Um, and I'm not gonna ask you for the money. So we're gonna do what we can uh, to modify what we needed to do without going where we wanted to with it. And we're fine with that. And then hopefully we can have some rescheduled trainings. Um, we had DC in a command class and a couple of other folks in some uh, pretty significant classes that were canceled due to COVID. So we're ongoing with that. Any questions about 2020? Okay. So I'm gonna start with level of service. You know, I use this word all the time and that's when you get into perspective and expectation. And level of service, we can all agree on putting water on the fire. That's the easy part. That's a deployment piece. If you ask Captain Del Monte, who's not here, he uses deployment all the time. His focus in the world is how fast can you get the hose off and put water on the fire? I agree, but there's other things as chief that I have to be looking at and that we have to be looking at. And one thing that's really scary, and I just grabbed six things, is paying attention in the news, right? So a chief, a town manager, there's all kinds of stuff that you can't even keep up with it. I get stuff in my inbox all the time, whether it's injuries that you have to pay attention to, whether it's something that's happening legally, whether it's uh, firefighters doing something stupid, it, we're constantly looking at things, you know, what are the hidden landmines we don't see? I'm, I'm paying attention to that all the time to make sure I'm not missing something, whether it needs to be a policy or is there something coming down the pike or just to stay in the know? Uh, really, there's so much going on that, that could take up half a day. So I throw that in there because I think it's important that it's not just about deployment. I'm trying to look at everything um, in a full, full, full view, 360. And I, I'm not gonna read that, but when Mrs. Jones calls 911, no matter what it is, Mrs. Jones expects the best, right? Um, they expect, they don't care if they're paid, volunteer, male, female, anything. <laughs> they just wanna know someone's coming to take care of their problem in that moment. And that comes down to level of service. So if you look at basic firefighting, and for you in the room, you won't hear the audio, right? But they'll hear it out in Zoom world. Yeah. All right, I'll put my mic. I'm gonna show a video quick. <coughs> And again, you're not gonna hear it here. It's okay, just watch the video. What you would hear on the audio is a second alarm being paged for 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, and a 10 minute alert for, this is 112 Seahawk. Oh, there you go.
Okay. I didn't show that to be scary. I didn't show it to be dramatic. I showed it because that's reality. That was our reality on December 20th at 320. So we can all sit here and talk about what is the expectation. The expectation is put that fire out. One, make sure there's no life safety issues. Two, put that fire out. And what is our exposures all at the same time? What do you want responding to that and how fast, right? That's the ultimate public safety question. And it's the hardest question to answer for especially at Duck, North Carolina. You can go to a larger city and a larger city would have a full complement. We had this conversation the other day of firefighters on that scene in probably 10 minutes. At the 10 minute alert, I'll show you who was there because that's just our reality with where we live. We are geographically challenged. We are financially challenged um, for something that happens twice a year. Right, so how do you find that balance? And we're gonna talk about that. So I, I use that video. For us, this was a successful fire in that it's fully involved on arrival, no one's hurt, fully involved on arrival, and we contained it and held it to the one structure. That for us, that's our goal on that, given that scenario at 320 on December 20th, that is our goal. No one hurt and we don't let it spread. Did we fulfill that mission? Yes. So when you look at the cascade events for any type of emergency, whether it's medical, surf rescue, active threat, we can't change when someone recognizes the emergency. We can't change them calling 911 and 911 being able to get extract the information we need to deploy. We can't change the dispatch chain of events. Where we make a difference is when the pager goes off or when they're called on the radio for law enforcement in response time, what we do when we get there and how we control and mitigate it. And finding that balance for service delivery is something I've talked about since day one. So this is how I've, I've used these circles before. This is how I look at it. We can train. We have some of the best instructors in the county. Uh, I'll use the example. Every Sunday, whatever shift is on, they choose the drill of the week. And every shift by the next Sunday has to do that drill of the week. And whoever's on Sunday gets the choice. So they get to choose the cool thing to do. We integrate it with our volunteers into the trainings over the course of the week. But every Sunday, 52 times a year, no matter what, there's a drill of the week. That doesn't take away from the weekly or the daily training, but there is a defined drill about something we might have to do every Sunday. You can check that circle. Maintenance of gear and equipment. Thank you, Town of Duck, in the money you can give us, the CIP planning we do, that we can keep good equipment and good working order so that's never an issue. That should never be the issue that we didn't get there quicker or that we didn't put out a fire because of the maintenance or gear or equipment issue. Safe and effective operations. We talk about risk management, constantly looking at SOGs, constantly looking at um, go, no go situations. We can control that to a lot of degree. But where we get into the unknowns and the things we can't control every variable is with response and with people. So how do we align our realities with stakeholder expectation? Forget stakeholder, I'm a stakeholder, right? What does Donna Black want when I call 911 if my house is on fire? So that's what I'm constantly looking at. And there's, you can look at NFPA, and I've brought this up before, you can look at a million ways of what's best and how you benchmark that. But what's really hard, it's hard to define every type of condition. Because I'm gonna drop down to NFPA 1720. If you read NFPA 1720, we are considered a rural area. If you look at our year round population of less than 500 per square mile, right? We have less than 500 and 2.32 square miles. So you can do the math. It says a reasonable response 80% of the time is minimum six firefighters in 14 minutes. Let's talk about six firefighters in 14 minutes at 112 UC Hawk. I, I, can't, I can't come to you and say that's good enough, right? So that's one extreme. The other extreme is 16 to 18 firefighters in 10 minutes. We're not gonna meet that. So how do we find that middle level of service that's effective, that's safe, that's financially feasible, and uh, we can accomplish that for something we're not doing every day? Best practice, don't care where you are, best practice of four person engine crew. It gives you two in, two out, which is a safety consideration. And it's four people capable of doing everything. So in my world, as I've said before, I try to figure out how to maintain four and I use volunteers to do that. 
I'm having a problem. We need to maintain three to get the engine out, which is why I'm asking for the fourth. We'll get to that. Our volunteer response. We have great volunteers. Um, and I'm going to shout out right now to Rick Fagerson, John Britt, I'm doing this off, Pat Scarlett, Nancy Cavanis. They are four 20 plus year volunteers. So imagine what they did 20 years ago. Awesome. What are they doing now? They can't do the same. They can't be Jake's now. They can't be Christians now. They've done their time. They're helping us in other ways through support and admin, but their time as physically helping us do physical tasks on a fire ground are over. We'll be forever thankful for their everything they've done over time, but that's not their job anymore. Ralph, our newest guy over there, I've, I've talked about him in previous meetings. He's the he's an example of our volunteers right now that live in Duck. He's eager. He will do as much as he can, but he's probably not going to run in the burning building. He's going to try to train for it. We're going to have to go like this No, but um, he's going to help us greatly, but he's not going to fulfill that role. Dedicated, but limited force. Um, we're going to focus on that second piece out. That doesn't help the first piece out because they're responding from home. They don't have all day just to sit around the firehouse. Um, They'll stand by to increase our first out personnel, which is what you're getting today. We have two volunteers riding with our crew. This is a good day, right? We can get some stuff done. Both of them that are riding today are support firefighters. They're not suppression firefighters. Uh, responding, they're gonna respond when they can, they're gonna train when they can, and they're capable to their abilities, but they're still limited. I can't put the same expectation on them as I can put on our career staff. Majority of our volunteers or support firefighters play a major role in completing that the task we need on scene, but it's still limited. Big positive is our change in response times. So I just took engine 111, and I took engine 111 because that was our newest engine. As soon as we got it, we, we put it out to deploy first. So in 2015, that was the first full year data we had basically to show response time. This is response time. I think we did it for everything major. Um, so that'd be an alarm activation and things like that. Look at 2015, 9.6 minutes response time from pager to arrival. What do you think? We have a small town, okay? But that's, Drew's over there going, oh God. <laughs> um, in 2015, what did we do in 2015? We only had a captain on until July. We were trying to supplement with our part-timers to keep two on and waiting for a driver. But in 2015, we were waiting for a volunteer driver the majority of the time to then roll the engine. In 2015, we put on two firefighters midway. In 2016, in April, we put on Brandon. So by the end of 2016, we had two assigned, two, not three, two assigned and then using volunteers on and on and on and on. Let's get to 2020. So what you really see in 2018, what happened in 2018, we took on the third round. So we had three firefighters assigned and we were using part-time to try to keep three on so we could roll immediately. You can see really the biggest change from 2018 to 2020. In 2019, that's probably the most accurate because that was the most, that was the year we only had deputy chief for half a year. We were keeping three on because it was just me in a command role. I wanted to make sure the guys were getting out safely regardless. So we used a lot more part-time and we, majority of the time I have to look back statistically with part-time and using three assigned um, to make sure we had three on, we were getting out, getting on scene. That's response time in five minutes, 5.55 minutes. 2020, it dropped, but I'll tell you what happened in 2020. We also modified, you'll see in a minute, we modified, we were leaving with two. We were going ahead and getting started. We had a lot of people out, and you'll see that slide in a minute. So 2019 is probably best reflective of what we can do if I can maintain three firefighters, suppression firefighters, anyone else is riding, bonus, but get, making sure we're getting out with three 24 seven. That is a really key slide to how our operations have changed over time and how they've improved. How am I doing? Good. Um, the other slide I'd like to do, and I know people can't be cut in, in tenths and halves, but I graphed the data from 2008 to 2020, basically. On average, how many times did we have three suppression firefighters? So when I say suppression, that means they can do anything. The expectation is they can do anything. How many times uh, or what year did we actually have three? 2008 <laughs> was the last time we could actually meet that statistically. 
If you look at 2019, we got the closest because what did we do? We added that third round and we were supplementing with part-time to try to keep three on uh, when we had a gap with the deputy chief. Look what happened in 2020. Okay, 2020, it went down. Why? Because we had so many people out and you'll see that in a minute. The other piece is the support firefighters. So that's our volunteers. So we don't have support firefighters that are paid. If you look at 2008, um, and this is really has to go with probably who, who was with us at that time as far as volunteers, support firefighters were getting out on that first out apparatus a lot quicker before we added that second round with the number twos. Then it really dropped off. It's come up a little bit because of two people today and a couple others, they're starting to stand by the station and more likely to get out. So I wanna see, ideally, I'd love to come to you with a graph that had four suppression firefighters, whatever combination, and if a support firefighter is riding and they're getting out, that's great. So that's why I put the four and the one. But at no time since 2008 have we been able to maintain three suppression firefighters on that first out apparatus. So what happened in 2020? These are our vacancies, and this is just for career staffing. From January to the end of April, 78% of the time, we had three on. A quarter of the time, we only had two. Now, if Joel, one of our volunteers, came and rode with us, I did not count that in this because I still want to get to four, remember, and he would just make it three. So this is just what happens with our career staffing and, and why you know I'm asking for two, you all know that already. From May to September, 76% of the time, we had three. Look what happened in the fall, which is why I came to you, why Joe let me come to you and say, we got a problem and that problem's not going to go away. Um, we had babies, it, two FMLAs, and then a long-term injury all at the same time. 43% of the time, we only had two uh, suppression firefighters out of our career. My goal is 103 and 100%. Next year, my graph, I want it to look like the end and my presentation will be a lot shorter. Um, where did that come from? Captains, 55% of the problem this year was captains. No offense, captains. Um, but there's a difference when it's a captain. It's a different level of decision-making. I can't stick the brand new fire, I can't stick Christian, no offense, Christian, into the captain's position right now. So if a captain's out, it changes my ability to fill that position. Uh, Jake Dempsey's with us today. He's acting captain until Captain Bartolotta comes back in an unknown date later this spring. Um, so our master firefighters can fill to there, but our firefighters at this point can't, part of our succession planning. Uh, and then about a quarter of the time it was master firefighters and a quarter time at the firefighter EMT level. The other thing we saw in 2020, and I, I don't show these in, in voice of doom by any means because we're responding and we're getting out, but we're not doing it with the same level of staffing. The blue line is July 2020. We had 23 volunteer firefighters and I think, what was it, six or seven um, part-timers. By the end of December 2020, 19 volunteers, three part-timers, okay? So we not only saw a shift because of FMLA, sick, and other things with career, we've also had a shift in not only our volunteers, but our part-timers. And, and Captain, or Captain uh, Chief Ackerman hit this, um, if we have some very similar issues, you know, you look at vacation, you look at FMLA, you know, there's, we, these guys don't want overtime right now, they need their time off. And we really saw that with the loss of part-timers. It is no fun to go work 24 hours in Nags Head and then come up here and have to be COVID sensitive for another shift. And for a while, we didn't even want them up here because we didn't want to cross-contaminate anything. So that really impacted the use of part-time. And this is the kicker, and I said this to you all in the October, November timeframe. In 2002, during incorporation, when we had 36 people on the roster, 16 were resident suppression firefighters. That's more than we have on staff. And over the course of time, and it's nothing, I'm, I'm trying to draw from 400 something people, over the course of time, a suppression firefighter doesn't live in Duck or doesn't have time. There's some great folks of firefighting age in, in town that feel guilty because they're like, I don't have time. I'm sorry, Donna, I can't volunteer with you. You've got to want to do it and you have to want to train for it and you have to have time for it. I think this will come back in time, but I don't think, I think it's going to come back by four in time maybe. Um, I think there's a couple out there that, that we can get maybe to that point, but we're not going to see 2002 again, not unless we have an influx of folks. 
So again, my struggle is how do you how do you balance that citizen expectation, the finances, the response, and the resources? Um, I didn't see Jeff's presentation when we used a a scale. Um, so what am I always looking at? Risk, best practices, data, financial impacts, and I should have highlighted the bottom one: the health and wellness of our firefighters. Mental wellness, top on my list too. Um, three of your career firefighters, you already know this, dealt with a fatal fire in Buxton in October, and you know we're constantly keeping an eye on them. They still have to come and do their full-time job doing the exact same thing with the you know, potential to go to a fire the next day. Um, we have to be mindful, even our volunteers. No one should be on 24-7, 365. Um, you've gotta be able to let them take a break. This is a town of duck thing. All of our incidents start and end with duck. No matter what we do, whether it's a jazz festival, whether it's a hurricane, whether we have flooding, it's gonna start and end with us and ultimately end with poor Drew with the, probably the checkbook. Um, but all incidents that are emergency or even potential emergency are gonna start with public safety. And I just wanna make sure that I can make these blue circles a little more red and that um, we're a little more comfortable with what we have. So again, call volume, good. We're not increasing a ton. So I don't anticipate that all of a sudden we're gonna need two more stations and 20 more people, right? Our call volume is pretty steady. We, we can kind of predict what a typical year is gonna be like. Our volunteers are down. Welcome to the volunteer world of 2020. They're down a little bit. They're actually up from 2019. Um, we were just up farther in the middle of the year. Some folks moved and then we got some people. That's always shifting. Um, I'm glad it's an uptick right now, that's good. We're a little, the red line is our career staffing. I'd like to see that against the end of 2020. I'd like to see three more at the end of that, so it'd be 14 and that includes your chief and deputy chief. And the big kicker is the purple line. We're just, there's no resident suppression firefighters that can get to the firehouse quick, get on that first out apparatus and help us supplement for what we need on that first out apparatus. So when you, when you look at, I know, I, I feel like I'm up here always asking for people but if you look at how we've asked for people, it's been phased and it's been when we've needed it. So if you look at when you graph it against the suppression firefighters to so when we've asked for full time, it basically, it met in the middle and then as, as it's gone down, that's when I continue to come back for you. And at the end of the day, that's all I'm looking for is if I can have this fourth firefighter, two more positions with the way we schedule, how they can take time off, trying to anticipate FLMA and everything else, if I can keep three on, I think that will hold us for a while. So looking ahead, and I love this picture of Jake, because it means Jake is, he started as a part-timer. He went to a firefighter. He's a master firefighter now. He's acting captain for the next few months. He, he's an example of the future of duck fire. So I love that picture to go with this. Um, when you look at how we're gonna go forward, I'm gonna just stick to the budget now, a few more slides and I'm done. But you also have to understand how we do budgeting with Duck Volunteer Fire Department Incorporated. So I'm gonna take a quick second to explain that. The town of Duck and how Duck Fire integrate with the budget process. So during the CIP, the fire chief prepares the CIP that goes to the town manager. The fire chief advises the board of directors on, on any additions or deletions, but they're well aware of the CIP planning process. So that part, I don't necessarily go back and get approval when we do the part we've just done. When we go to do the annual budget, uh, I get the budget seat sheets from town, the, I prepare the budget and our direct allocation request, which I'll get to in a minute. I prepare the budget, including the CIP. I sit with the board of directors and actually the memo that, that Drew will get is um, from me and the board of directors requesting this for FY, in this case, uh, 21, 22. So I submit it on behalf of the board of directors to the town manager for consideration when you do everything. So what is that direct allocation? Because if you look, if you, we probably have the shortest <laughs> actual uh, department head sheet with money because unlike Chief Ackerman where everything's uh, laid out in the town budget, I have a whole separate budget at the fire department. I have more, I think I have more categories than the town does um, from toilet paper to water. Um, but we have our own budget within. So when we come to you for a direct allocation, that's for lights, that's for insurance. We pay our own insurance, um, the audit, uh, you name it, fire operations, utilities, building maintenance and repair. A couple things that Chief Ackerman brought up. We are gonna now look at budgetary things. We were kind of splitting supplies like toilet paper and other things. We've already met, like how can we just, I'll take it, just put it in my budget. 
let the firehouse take care of it and they're not using it at the same rate we are. We've already talked about some, some efficiencies there. Still probably means an adjustment in the direct allocation. How do our member t-shirt -shop, shop operations fit into that? It's a separate um, account and I'll get to that in a minute, but we'll use those donations. We'll use any t-shirt funding, one, to sell the t-shirts because we can't do it. So there's a cost of doing business. It's not, we just take in money. Um, we've got to cover the cost to get them and to sell them. It pays for all our uniforms and gear. So those that are sitting in the office, everything you see them wearing right now comes out of that fund. That doesn't come out of the revenue side of municipal revenue. We cover it through that fund. Uh, again, we're um, dressing not just us, but, but volunteers as well. Now, turnout gear, that's coming out of the larger municipal budget, but we take care of dressing for duty gear and class A's. Uh, volunteer physicals, we were doing all physicals. I'm trying to shift the budget to where the career staff are covered under, uh, under the town and then let the volunteers be covered because that is an expense. We, we're not making the same money. You know, again, t-shirts are soft money. Um, so that was getting a little pricey. So I have shifted the medical to the municipal side. And then we hold an annual banquet and awards. Um, again, there's no, no volunteer gets, gets a paycheck of any sort. They just, uh, we, we dress them, we feed them, and we acknowledge them at the end of the year. So at the bottom, you'll see, I basically approve expenditures once the budget's approved and we get it and we know what we have. I approve everything, I have a stamp. The board of directors signs any checks. I do not have signing privileges. Um, municipal revenues are in one bank account, in one bank, and the member operations are in another bank account in another bank, and that's our checks and balances, and we are audited every year by the same auditor that you use. So I, I don't know that anyone understood how our budget process worked with the, the fire department, because it's seamless. <laughs> you don't see, that's all behind the scenes stuff, but, um, but that's how the budget operates and really thought was a good thing to do today also, so Drew understood. So looking forward to FY21 and 22, We've already talked about the CIP. There's no surprises in there with our general stuff of air packs and turnout gear. Um, truck 11's been in, in the wings and I have shifted that now. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, our CIP is always allowed for that phasing and it's flexible. Um, the radios are out of our control, okay? And I'm down my last couple slides. The radios are out of our control. That's nothing we can do and we'll give Trey a few minutes when you're ready. I am flexible and I'll, I'll say now, uh, turnout gear we can't get behind on and we need to be thinking about engine 11. Everything else, again, like Chief Ackerman, don't care. I need the people. I need the people and I need to be able to get them there. Um, stuff is stuff right now. The people is the most important piece and uh, I'll leave that at that for now. The, my direct budget allocation request that'll come from talking with the board, you can see how much I've increased since 2016. Insurance has gone up more than cost of living per year. I would like to see an adjustment there, but it wouldn't be significant. Um, I can talk to the town manager and with the board about that, but I've got to be able to pay for the audit. I got to be able to pay for insurance and we've seen very little increase though requested over time. I have not gotten it um, just so that we can keep the lights on. So when you look at CIP, turnout gear is my priority um, just because we can't get behind on that. Talking about engine 11 over the next couple of years, a modest increase in the allocation just to run the firehouse and then asking for the two positions. So from a 2022 standpoint, the two positions in turnout gear, <laughs> a slight modification in direct allocation. Beyond that, the public safety building, I, I'm with Chief Ackerman. It's, I, we need people, we need to keep the town safe. Um, Drew had an opportunity to tour it the other day. 75% uh, of your town staff runs out of that building that was built in 1982 for 19 volunteers. Um, we're now there 24 seven. We've got three people, hopefully, <laughs> uh, sleeping there every night 24 seven. We just don't, there's no space. It's not it, it, COVID safe, it's not. Um, Again, it's something we need to be looking towards. It's not up the co code and all that. So it, it needs to stay in the planning process. But again, I appreciate the financial challenge. Uh, we've changed from truck 11 to engine 11, because you need to remember, I need to be able to get water on a fire. And if there's anything wrong with our first out engine 111, I need a backup engine. And we are having some issues. It is going to be 20 years old in 2005, and we're having some pump issues. I wanted the truck first gone because it's a lot of electronics, but knock on wood, we've had normal repairs and maintenance and we've been able to keep it in service. 
I need water on engines and I need a backup. So that's why we switched that. And it also comes with a much lower price tag. Um, career staffing and succession planning, those will be on ongoing discussions. And of course, ongoing volunteer recruitment retention. Um, that's just part of doing business. We'll continue te teamwork, especially with our partners with police um, and surf rescue. We work the most with Southern Shores. We cover chief where we cover each other um, and obviously with Dare County on medical calls. Um, very proud of the stuff we're doing with social media. And this is a shout out to Nancy Cavanis who handles this for us, but we communicate our brand. We do a lot of educational, motivational stuff between Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, and also it's aligned with the town and it's aligned with the county. So nothing's going out that, doesn't, that isn't consistent with working with Christian. Our continued challenges, geography. So I did pictures because I knew you guys would be done by this point. So I'll just go through the pictures quickly. Geography, always a challenge. Can't get people here any quicker than they can get here. Um, they're gonna respond and they're gonna get here. Uh, upper right, you see the fire out at 106 Bayberry. We have large houses. They're close together. We got lucky at Seahawk. Um, we're always gonna be a challenge with not getting to that fire once it breaks through um, and making sure we, we again train and respond to be able to manage that. Bottom right is the extrication that was done with two people with Jake and, and Jose on a night in December, 2019. We're constantly training. We, we have to be good at a lot of things and um, and that will, you know, we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to train. Staffing, you know, will be, I'd like to get us to that point where I can consistently have three. What keeps me up at night? That's what keeps me up at night. Uh, going right around the circle here, you can see Boyd and Rick. Appreciate all of our volunteers. Um, we have a great group that are responding and helping. They are aging in that top graph, which I'll end with is there's no one to draw from. I can't get blood out of the turnip. I would love to have 10,000 people to draw from to, to keep it a lot more volunteers. We just don't have that capability. And the middle picture there of the duck barbecue, I forget what it says. It's like dine and donate and duck or something. Please don't make us go back to the pig picking days because it was a lot of work and a different time, however fun. Um, but those are our challenges. But the good news is your public safety staff, we do a lot with a little. So these are the four people that were on scene for almost 20 minutes at Seahawk. You had Jackie uh, Keen, who was great because her communications on the radio, we knew exactly what we were coming to. We knew where it was collapsing. We knew what was involved. We knew there was no one in there. It changes our ability to respond and where we had to focus. And then, um, Captain Del Monte and Matt were on the engine and then I came up and got to do cool firefighter stuff, which doesn't happen all that often. Um, but again, we do a lot with public safety with a little and we will continue to do that through training. Um, I'm gonna end with this, we are Duck Fire. That's our coin, Service Pride community. We have a great group of people that love serving the community and they're good at it. They're good within their capable roles. And um, I, I'm proud to be able to, to be the chief of uh, such a great group of folks and some that are watching here today and some that are listening. Um, cannot say enough about Joe. Uh, thank you, Joe, for all you've done. You've been a great advocate for town, but also for the employees and we welcome you. And I had to do one Paul Combs um, cartoon. He does a lot of fire cartoons, um, basically on all the personalities. I did it for Joe and then I'm like, well, it applies to Drew too. So thank you, Joe, welcome Drew. And I'll take any questions. So to that down, Chief, you want two firefighters? Yep. At the end of the day, wake up. That's all I That's what I did in that. You could have said that in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to torture you a little bit. Um, Chief is open for questions, Council. <laughs> Nancy or Monica? At this point, I don't have any except that. Uh, are they asleep? Could I have a question? I do have a quick question. Um, you you brought it in, Donna. The um, the the firefighter that we approved uh, was a half position uh, halfway this last year. Um, that was because we were. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I missed oh. the beginning of it, Monica. Oh, sorry. Okay. The the firefighter position that you've alluded to in your one of your charts the, toward the end with the with the new position that we funded, which was a half a position as I understand it. That was um, because that made up for someone who was leaving that was a 
of dedicated volunteer, as I recall. Um, and so bottom line is that when you when we when we sort of patched the situation up during the middle of the year this year with uh, allowing another half position, I believe, now what we're saying is that you know to fill out the organization, you want to bring in two more people that are equal to the person that you just brought in. Am I understand? Is that my right about that? Yes. Yes. And what we did last year, um, we requested three last year. Obviously, with COVID, it didn't make the budget. So, what Chris did do is a lot, a lot more part-time money, so we could create kind of that permanent part-time half-time position. That okay. We had Christian in. When Noah left to take another job, we already had half a salary. That's why it didn't cost a lot of money in this current budget year to okay. to make that transition. Um, right. But yes, I'm asking now for two more of what is Spencer to round out that Spencer's one of the three requests from last year. So I'm just asking for two more permanent so that there's four assigned so we can keep three on. Okay, and that's that's what I needed. Just that reminder about what we did last year. And that was supplemented by removing the part-time money that um, we had kind of as a compromise, I guess we call it from last year's budget cycle. Okay, thank you. What's it, what's it cost the two? For generally, two? Generally just ballpark. <laughs> That, maybe 60s for one, right? I think that's what we calculated. If we brought in entry level again. 120, 125? Yeah. Not, not including gear or anything like that. Right. So gear at this point, we can still absorb with our, our regular turn. Yeah, again, it's a little different. Chief Ackerman has a different challenge because of the equipment needed. Um, in the future, you might see a little bit of gear increase, but I would counteract that with the CIP in a different way. Any other comments or questions for the chief? I just Monica. like to, I just like to thank uh, you for bringing in the history as well as the vision, simply because we do have a lot of folks that um, that you know didn't see the evolution of of, of the department um, as we were all living through it. Um, you know, and even for my own, even the, although I was here, it's always nice to kind of see that um, how things evolved and uh, just the data is is uh, is beneficial. So thank you for that. Thank you. History, speaking of the history chief, we've never had an issue renewing our five-year lease. And at one point in time, it was with the county and then it moved over to the volunteer fire department. Yeah, and I, I can research when that happened, um, but this is what happens about a year out. We request it and then they, they it takes about a year. Um, obviously they know we're in the middle of, of what we're trying to do here, but I would in 2022, we need to sit down and at least say, hey, you know, we need to look at this again. And um, it's been seamless. They just send it over. I think the last two rounds, there actually was a fee to it, which was the first time, but it was just a few hundred dollars. Um, and then it's, it's, it's a standard lease. It says the same thing every year. And we have a good relationship with the local court. A great relationship with the local folks. I'll give an example. We were talking to Drew the other day. They're building a new building, office building over there, and they've included us even in on some of the planning from a life safety issue and a fire issue. Um, they, like I said, Mark Pressure was over the other day uh, seeing the building. They're really interested in the building. Um, we had a fire alarm over there. We've had a couple calls over there. We had an alarm over there at lunch a few, it was a couple months ago now. And uh, of course we responded and they're all outside with their sandwiches because they evacuated like they should. They're like, what took you so long? You know, kidding, because we come, they love that we're on property, both police and fire. Um, <laughs> it's a safety thing. No. Yeah. Any more questions? I don't think so. 